Now I have the distinct honor and pleasure of introducing Arnaud de Borsgrave, who will lead the next panel. Uh, Arnaud needs no introduction. He's a legendary journalist, as you all know. He's the director of the Transnational Threat Project at CSIS, as well as a senior advisor at CSIS. A 30-year veteran of Newsweek, uh, at the age of uh, 27, made senior editor, a position he held for 25 years was lead, later the uh, editor-in-chief of the Washington Times, president and CEO of UPI, a man whose uh, list of accomplishments, publications, are just boundless, so I recommend his bio to you. Uh, it's really been an honor for me to, to be a part of CSIS as a senior advisor and to work with Arnaud and to learn from him. Uh, he will lead the next panel. It's really a pleasure to introduce him. Uh, and I, I will say one thing about Arnaud. Uh, he has always been ahead of his time. Uh, whether it's his publications, his writings, or his work, he's always been on the forefront. So with that, without further ado, Arnaud de Borschgrave. Thank you. His Highness Prince Turkey Al Faisal and uh, Ambassador Negroponte. Great privilege for me to introduce uh, two dear friends of very long standing. Uh, Prince Turkey Al Faisal directed, as you probably know, his intelligence service uh, for 25 years. Um, he uh, then became ambassador to the UK and uh, later to Washington. Uh, he is also founder or co-founder of the King Faisal Cultural Foundation, which straddles uh, the past and the technological future. Uh, he is the son of the founder of the kingdom, grandson of the founder of the kingdom, uh, king known as Ibn Saud or Abdulaziz, and he is the son of uh, the late King Faisal. And as for John Negroponte, I first met him in Vietnam when he was a very young diplomat in the mid-60s, and he went on, as, to, as you probably know, to play a very important role in bringing about a settlement in Vietnam way ahead and working for Henry Kissinger at the time. Uh, John has been uh, ambassador in all sorts of important places. He was the first ambassador to liberate Iraq. He was the uh, ambassador of the United Nations, ambassador to Mexico, ambassador to the Philippines, Honduras, and I think I may be missing one. He was uh, a deputy secretary of state. He was a deputy national security advisor. And uh, more lately, he was the first director of national intelligence. I think we'll start it off. Uh, Prince Turkey told me he had a few things to say before we get into questions. Thank you, Arno. A slight correction on Arno's introduction. The intelligence service was not my intelligence service. It was the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia's intelligence service. <laughs> <laughs> um, Ms. Napolitano put it very well when she spoke here this morning in saying that terrorism did not begin with Al-Qaeda, nor will it end with the death of Osama bin Laden. And uh, from that context, I have just a few remarks to make about the report that was mentioned in the previous uh, um, session. Um, these remarks I sent to Arno, which I'm sure he shared with them, um, had to eliminate recruitment uh, to terrorism. Uh, it takes a lot of effort, but the most important thing is to try to resolve the issues that operate as recruiting tools for the terrorists. And these are mostly political issues in my view. Um, mention was made of things going sour, let's say, in Saudi Arabia or Pakistan. Um, but I think what is important is that we live now today uh, such issues as in Kashmir, the Caucasus, uh, Palestine, um, the Horn of Africa, and one has to find ways of resolving those issues uh, in order to pull the rug from under the recruiters who, if you watch the, the cyberspace appeals that are put out by these recruiters to young people, they mainly rely on scenes depicting these, uh, these problems in these areas. So I hope that the report will focus on promoting solutions for these uh, problems. 
And the other thing that the report did not mention, which I think is very important, is the need for an international center for counterterrorism. This has been on, on the table of the international community since 2005, when a conference on counterterrorism was held in Riyadh. Ms. Townsend, I believe, was, was attending that conference. And one of the main recommendations there was that there should be a counterterrorism center where not only information is pooled, but also know-how. Many of these countries in the world where the terrorism operates from, whether it is in the Yemen or in, in sub-Saharan Africa or in some Asian countries, simply don't have the capabilities, either financial or human, to challenge the presence of these uh, terrorist groups that operate from them. And in order to get those things in hand, uh, we need to pool, as I said, not only the information, but also the know-how. Um, you know, uh, being here so a few days just before the anniversary of September 11th, that event weighs heavily on my shoulders as a Saudi. Uh, 50 years from now, 100, 200 years from now, whenever September 11th uh, comes about, um, Saudi citizens will be the ones mainly blamed for the event. And that is a heavy weight for any citizen of a country to bear. Uh, a slight consolation to that, in my view, is that the kingdom has been the leading country in fighting Al-Qaeda and eliminating the cells and the other structure of Al-Qaeda, not only within Saudi Arabia, but also by sharing information and know-how with our allies in the United States and in Europe and in the Middle East, uh, hopefully we can help in eliminating that scourge uh, from uh, the world. Um, we have successfully dismantled and eliminated uh, Al-Qaeda cells so that now for the past six years, I think, or five years, we've had absolutely no terrorist, successful terrorist operation in, uh, in, in the kingdom. That's a blessing from God doesn't mean that it's not going to happen. It might. We still have to face that problem uh, when it comes. But one of the things that we learned from our experience is that you have to treat with Al-Qaeda holistically. You can't simply use security measures. You can't simply use political measures. It's not a matter of buying off people with money. It's not a matter of simply using one or another or a third. You have to use all of these methods. And in that effort, the kingdom I think has successfully combined all of those things in fighting Al-Qaeda, and not just in Saudi Arabia, but hopefully in other parts of, uh, of the world. Um, and I'm reminded in this of last year's aborted uh, mail paper bombs, mail parcel bombs that were coming to Chicago uh, via the Yemen when Saudi Arabian intelligence tipped off American and European intelligence services on these parcel bombs, and they were intercepted. Fortunately and thankfully, before they caused any harm anywhere. The other thing I think I would like to, to mention is that uh, um, the people in the country are the key. Uh, terrorists like Bin Laden or others would like to present themselves as either liberators of people or as saviors or as somehow uh, providing uh, uh, a solution for, for their problems. And if they succeed in doing that, then you're lost. But fortunately, if you can get the people on your side, they become your first line of defense and your early warning system. Many uh, terrorist attempts in the kingdom were forestalled because of citizens picking up the telephone and calling the local police sta station and saying, I see suspicious activity in the neighborhood, whether it is a house or a person or a car. And that leads to investigation, and that investigation generally has succeeded in disrupting uh, these terrorist uh, activities. This is what I have to say. Thank you so much, Prince Turkey. Ambassador Negroponi, would you like to say a few things yeah, yeah. before we get into questions? Thank, thank you, Arno, and thanks for the introduction. And uh, Your Highness, pleasure to nice to see you be again. here with you and to see you again. Arno, uh, you say we go back a long ways. I think we first met in 1964 in Saigon. And 
Arno was a fantastic war correspondent, still are. It goes out to some pretty uh, challenging places to cover uh, local situations. And I, I stand in awe of, uh, of uh, how well you still do that. Um, just a couple of points. I think there are two key issues. Uh, I, Prince, Prince Turkey raised the question of, uh, of the root causes and getting to the bottom of whatever gives rise to terrorist activity, and I couldn't agree with him more, and I also agree that the remedies have to be holistic. There's no silver bullet that's gonna solve these problems for you. So that's, that's one, one side of the issue. And then I think uh, related, but I find it a fairly universal problem, and that is the issue of governance, and particularly, and governance of course has to do with the ability of a state or a country to come to grips with root causes, but specifically competence in the security area. I mean, it's one thing to stand there with a uniform and a gun, it's another to really know uh, how to, to solve uh, uh, problems uh, of terrorism, and that, that is a skill, I think a skill that uh, where there's been substantial improvement during the past uh, decade or so, but where there's still a long ways to go, and I think that if you look around the world, it's in places where these problems of governance and of inadequacy of security forces, uh, that uh, there's probably a greater likelihood that terrorist activities of various kind kinds uh, might be successful. So th those would be two points. And, and the only other point I, I would make is that um, obviously this problem, as has already been said, and I'm sure will be said uh, repeatedly, uh, didn't start uh, with 9-11, with uh, and it won't end there. But when Arno uh, reeled off the different countries to which I had been <laughs> ambassador and had served, I mean, every single one of them, uh, we've had uh, terrorist activities of one kind or another uh, to deal with. So uh, uh, regrettably, uh, these kinds of activities have not spared any particular part of the world and are not unique to any particular location, although at the moment uh, they seem to be con concentrated in certain particular areas. Well, Peter Bergen, uh, who is one of the best known experts on Al-Qaeda, uh, who was um, quoted recently as saying it's time to call off uh, the war on terror. And then we had uh, Defense Secretary Panetta on his first trip to Afghanistan in which he said, it's now just a question of killing seven, eight, nine, or 10 more people and it will be over. I take it you both disagree with that. I certainly do. And uh, I don't know what the context was of either of these gentlemen's uh, comments were, but uh, uh, Terrorism will be with us, uh, whatever the, the circumstances. People will find excuses to commit these, uh, these horrible crimes for whatever uh, reason they, they may divine in their minds. Sometimes it's megalomania, sometimes it's political ambition or whatever. But uh, uh, Laden is not the end of the terrorism. What I think is, is important, though, is that the death of Bin Laden, particularly in this country, which I'm very glad that it happened uh, as a result of his own um, uh, sort of nihilistic and, and really vicious and, and barbaric uh, killing of, of people and justifying them with high moral principles. Uh, the, uh, the killing of Bin Laden has not gotten the accolades that it deserves. Uh, not just throughout the world, but, but even in this country. Uh, and I think the war on terrorism between quotation marks after September 11th, uh, I remember President Bush saying, we're going to get him, dead or alive. Uh, President Obama reiterated that um, uh, sentence almost word for word during his campaign and after he became president. And I think it should have been given more more value, if you like, or, or worth uh, by, uh, by, uh, by the American people and by the rest of us in, in the rest of the world. And I say that because I've been advocating for the last few years that the United States should kill Bin Laden or arrest him and then declare 
victory and withdraw from Afghanistan. Now, I know there are those who will say, oh, we can't leave Afghanistan in the way that, that it is. And I don't mean withdrawing your embassy or your economic aid or your other support, uh, but having troops on the ground in, in, in Afghanistan has never succeeded. Uh, starting with Alexander the Great, going on through all of the conquerors that, that uh, followed him. Uh, the Soviets are the recent uh, example of that. And I'm afraid America will come at a time, whether it is next year or the year after, or the year after that, when it will inevitably have to withdraw. And this would have been the perfect moment to declare victory and to leave with a victory behind and not to go on and sort of continue in this endless uh, measure of, of strike, counter-strike. Uh, the Afghan people will not, uh, will not accept foreign troops in, in their country, and, and they're going to fight them. And more and more, as I read in your press reports, um, it's not just the Pashtuns who are fighting back against American soldiers. Now it's gaining uh, a nationwide complexion, uh, whether you call them Taliban, uh, tribal uh, factions, or whatever you want to call them, um, uh, Uzbeks and Tajiks and even Hazaras uh, are joining the fight against NATO and, and the United States. So killing Bin Laden, I thought, would have been the perfect moment when your president can say, we have been victorious, and this is the timetable we set for withdrawal of our troops, and goodbye, and good luck. But it hasn't happened that way. I hope that, uh, that it will. <laughs> Prince Turkey, uh, you were uh, one of the few who dealt with Mullah Omar, the head of Taliban. I think I'm the only journalist who ever interviewed him, which was three months before 9-11. Do you think a deal with him is possible? I think now, frankly, uh, Mullah Omar is, is extraneous. Um, all the information that we see is that he's probably somewhere in Pakistan, not even in Afghanistan. And it is becoming more of, of, of a nationalist resistance movement uh, to, uh, to the presence of foreign troops there. So Mullah Omar would be one of many, uh, whether uh, regional, tribal, or other leaderships within Afghanistan that are conducting the resistance to these foreign troops. Uh, John, where do you come out on this? Because there's... Well, I, uh, I think, in a way, the solution that, uh, to our troop presence that uh, Prince Turkey described is sort of what we're doing, but we're doing it in slow motion. And in a way, my reaction to Mr. Panetta's statement was exactly that. He was saying that in reference to the continued presence of our forces in the region. Uh, so yes, terrorism will continue, and the quote unquote, if you will, war on terror, which people have a lot to say about whether that's a, a misnomer or not, will, will go on. But the question is whether you need to do it with the deployment of regular military forces. And I see us inevitably withdrawing from uh, Afghanistan, and I see us doing it uh, somewhere around the 2014 deadline that has been stipulated uh, by NATO, and I interpret, rightly or wrongly, the uh, deployment of Ambassador Ryan Crocker to Kabul as uh, having been sent there to try to negotiate with uh, Afghanistan, something similar to the withdrawal agreement that he negotiated with Iraq. When I was deputy secretary, I told Ryan, I said, Ryan, the great thing about your status of forces agreement and Henry Kissinger's uh, Paris peace accord, which was called the agreement uh, to end the war and restore peace in Vietnam, is that neither of them accurately describe uh, what was in fact agreed to, which was the withdrawal of United States forces. And I think uh, Ryan is uniquely qualified to negotiate a similar agreement with uh, the Afghan government. So people are always talking about, well, can you negotiate with Mullah Omar or the Taliban? I think we're going to end up negotiating with the Afghan government. 
Uh, when I was born, there were two billion people in the world. Now there are seven billion. And uh, we have, uh, I think it's uh, four, million, four billion uh, cell phones of one kind or another. Two billion people are online. We have WikiLeaks. We have social media. How is all this changing the game of nations in your judgment? Definitely it has changed it. Uh, just look at what happened recently in the Arab world. Um, I remember at a, at a conference uh, early this year, um, the American representative there uh, invited us all uh, to attend a, uh, a ceremony in the White House in which she said uh, President Obama and Secretary of State Clinton and other dignitaries will be there, as well as Facebook and Twitter and uh, <laughs> Google and, and others. And I had to raise my hand and say, are you sure it is safe for the president to be there with the Secretary of State and all the government officials while Facebook and Twitter and the others are operating? And uh, so, yes, uh, it has changed uh, the way things are, are, are done. Uh, so-called people power is, uh, is, is, is the operating factor here. And people can connect directly with each other now more quickly, uh, too quickly for, for government uh, um, uh, authorities to, uh, to either prevent them or, or even sometimes to, to trace them. One of the ironies, of course, is that uh, in Egypt, of course, and, and and, Somal and uh, Tunis and in other countries, uh, governments or authorities tried to shut the services for internet and, and other such uh, facilities. Uh, and now we see that even when riots broke out in London, the only recourse the government had was to look at possibilities of shutting down the internet and the services of Facebook and, and Twitter. That's, I think that's an indication of where uh, the, the, the people, as it were, uh, have, uh, have, have gained the, the upper hand in this particular uh, situation. And I know that uh, when I look at my children, for example, and see them operating all of these things, um, it's a different world from the one that, that I grew up in. John? But the flip side, I, I agree with everything that Turkey said, but the flip side, of course, is that in, I, I think if you look at what happened uh, at, in 9-11 and then subsequently is that the power uh, and the, the power that this information technology also puts into the hands of our intelligence community in, in terms of abilities to d discern and detect what's going on, sorting out uh, uh, relevant from irrelevant information, uh, targeting terrorists. When you think of the multiplicity of information technologies that have been used to track down uh, people like uh, Abu Musab uh, al-Zarqawi, uh, in Iraq, uh, this was a, uh, in effect, a tribute to the utility of these modern technologies also in countering uh, some of these terrorist activities. So it works both ways. Yes. We see a prominent member of Al Qaeda, Abdel Karim, uh, I think, uh, I forget his name, Nejad or something like that. He is now in charge of the military establishment in Tripoli. Mm -hmm. He's a former Al Qaeda type who was tortured uh, under rendition in Bangkok, and who said on television yesterday, I'm not holding any of that against the United States, which of course elicited quite a few chuckles. Don't you think that uh, this is helping Al Qaeda, what's happening in Tripoli today, what's happening in Syria? Isn't there, is, is that a plus or a minus for Al Qaeda? Well, the presence of this particular person, I don't know much about him in, in, the, in the fight against, against Gaddafi, may have ramifications which uh, people better informed than I am can, uh, can judge. But uh, I think Al-Qaeda is on the losing side of history today um, as, as a cult, uh, as, as a philosophy, uh, and equally importantly as a, uh, a political and, and military, if you like, um, uh, organization. Uh, because of the damage that they have caused uh, universally. Um, their, their bloodthirstiness 
and their viciousness has been quite universal. And if you like, democratic. Uh, they were willing to sacrifice everybody for their ideal. And this has, of course, created a counter uh, attack on them from, from people in, in general. So I don't think Al-Qaeda is winning anymore. As I said, that doesn't mean that there is going to be an end uh, to terrorism in whatever name or banner or under any banner that they may, people may raise. But uh, the Al-Qaeda's way of doing things, I think, now is, is passé. John? Yeah, not to mention that their agenda, you know, if, if you take it seriously, isn't exactly what 99% of the world aspires to. It's not Absolutely. the way they aspire to live. Uh, I, on the point about what's happening in, uh, in Libya or what happened in Egypt or what might happen in Syria, I think uh, we have to take our chances. Uh, clearly, in all these situations, particularly, I think, Libya and Syria, there's a similarity with Iraq in the sense that uh, natural political life, if you will, has been suppressed for so long that it's not th that easy to tell what's going to emerge once the lid is taken off. And in Egypt, certainly, and in Syria, you've got pretty strong uh, S uh, Muslim Brotherhood movement, so you don't know how that's going to evolve, which, which direction are they going to take once they're free to, to express themselves. But uh, as opposed, as compared with the existing situation, I mean, I think Syria really needs a political change, number one. Number two, I think that uh, the demise of uh, President uh, Bashar al-Assad would lead to uh, the likelihood, not the certainty, but the likelihood that Syria would lose, that uh, Iran would lose its only real Arab friend. And I think that would be an important geopolitical development. I have a question from the floor. How do we get people, the citizenry, on our side to address His Royal Highness's point in an American climate where trust in government is low and the political climate is so hostile? I wouldn't dare speak for America. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not sure I want to <laughs> on this, except to say that uh, it may not be quite as bad as we sometimes describe it. And uh, I think that there's still uh, a pretty high level of confidence uh, in uh, our security institutions. Certainly the military is popular, and I think people understand that we made a lot of improvements in uh, law enforcement and intelligence during the past 10 years. Um, how do we deal with some of these issues? Of course, we don't face the most serious internal terrorist threat as compared to other countries, but I think uh, good governance, which we've already mentioned, and a little bit of prosperity wouldn't hurt. I mean, the world's gone through some, uh, particularly the West, has gone through some bad economic times. I wonder if we wouldn't talk and think a little bit differently about all these questions if we started getting back to, some, to a period of robust economic growth, which I sincerely hope uh, can happen sometime in the not too distant future. But as far as we can see into the future, there are growing shortages of almost everything. Water, number one. Doesn't that indicate that there will be permanent friction, tension, and terrorist activities as far as we can see into the future? Well, I mean, oil can be, uh, the, an abundance of oil can be a curse. A shortage of it could also lead to adoption of other technologies and uh, necessity is the mother of invention. I think certainly in the United States, the, the greater problems we face, and there's a whole national debate now being undertaken as to how to get the economy growing again, has to do with a lot of other factors, including education, training, uh, helping the workforce uh, adapt to modern circumstances and so forth. So it too, just like dealing with terrorism, needs a holistic approach. Can I just say something yes. here? Um, America, has been um, an example to the rest of the world in how Americans do things. And uh, I come from a country that is uh, relatively young in age and that looks upon the experience of America as uh, a study case for where we want to go. And uh, it's a fascinating experience to watch how America deals with its problems. Uh, sometimes successfully, sometimes not so successfully. But I think America will remain 
that example that people look to uh, to learn how to avoid pitfalls, but also how to progress and, and to go forward. Your technological achievements are unparalleled anywhere in the world. When I was ambassador here, I was struck by the workaholic nature of your people. Um, you know, from 7 o'clock in the morning until 7 o'clock in the evening, it's work, 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 work. You go to, to lunch and you work. They even have breakfast work sessions. <laughs> and, and, you know, reception work sessions. And so everybody is working all the time. And it's not just in Washington. And I used to visit in, in, in various other places. The energy uh, expended by Americans in, 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 in the effort to, to gain a livelihood is exemplary. You're only outshone by two people that I know of, the Japanese and the Koreans. Uh, and otherwise, you spend more hours working than, than all the rest of us. Uh, how that energy and that expenditure of, of, of effort allows you to have economic problems or medical problems or uh, shortages uh, in, 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 uh, in other things, a bad uh, highway system, that is still a puzzle to me. Uh, and I'm waiting to see how you're going to get out of that. Prince Turkey, another question from the floor. With so much at stake, is it possible to overcome political, religious, and cultural differences between the US and the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia in, in the fight against Al Qaeda? Well, there are no differences between us in the fight against Al Qaeda. Uh, where we may have differences uh, that we've had historically, whether it is over Palestine or other issues like that, uh, we've overcome them. Uh, we stood by each other over 60 years of, of, of tough, tough situations. Uh, the young people in this audience don't remember when, when the so-called red menace uh, threatened the, uh, the world. Um, uh, insurrections and, and uh, assassinations and upheavals uh, throughout uh, the, the globe were, were the, the, the mark of, of, of those of the years. And the kingdom was a victim of those efforts. And working with the United States was always a boon to us. Uh, we as Saudis never forget uh, how you stood with us. Uh, in those years, particularly at the time when Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait and seemed to be ready to invade uh, Saudi Arabia. Those are uh, issues where we came together to face certain situations. Of course, we had our differences as well. So uh, it's an up and down affair between us, but it's a strategic alliance, I think, that we have uh, with each other, and especially on the issue of terrorism. And the example I gave in my presentation about the parcel bombs that were intercepted was one of many other examples that could be uh, pointed at uh, where either information from America to Saudi Arabia helped abort certain uh, uh, bad things from happening in the kingdom or vice versa. There's uh, one more question for Prince Turkey. You spoke of the need for shared intelligence uh, and know-how in countries and, in, and intelligence agencies. Does this require agreement? What group should be classified as terrorist organization? What happens when a group such as Hamas is uh, considered a terrorist organization by some countries, such as the United States and Israel, but not by others? Well, that, that works equally well. Uh, I think if you say from an Arab point of view that some Israeli actions are considered terrorist actions. Um, the uh, destruction of, of, of homes, the targeted killing, the incarceration of thousands of Palestinians in prisons without trial, etc. Um, that should not hold us back from, from sharing information on what we clearly see as common threats to us all. Uh, and uh, already, when I was in intelligence uh, in, in, in my career, uh, we used to share information with the U.S. and with other people. The problem today is that the communications have become so quick, and events inevitably will, will go on and not wait for somebody to verify a piece of information that came from here or the, who's the source of that information. 
So holding back on, on intelligence uh, from others, I think, is harmful and detrimental. That's why the need for this center to, to pool information and know-how is essential. And the kingdom made that proposition to the United Nations, uh, whereby everybody can join together in, uh, in sharing that, uh, that information and know-how. And that's the only way I think you can face threats of, of terrorism and whoever is behind them. So the Arab-Israeli problem is not an impediment in your view about uh in terms of counterterrorism, No, I don't think so. John? Um, I would just qualify that, so I'd say it's somewhat of a problem. I remember when I was ambassador to the United Nations, we worked on these, uh, there's four or five conventions or treaties on, uh, concerning terrorism, terrorism against aircraft, terrorism against this, that, and then there's one on uh, where we actually had to define terrorism. And I think that treaty, that draft treaty has been hung up for 25 or 30 years because we've not, because of, I think in, in some measure, because of the uh, Arab-Israeli dispute, been able to uh, agree finally to what a, a, a definition, a technical definition of terrorism. It comes down to a, a couple of words that are, are disagreed. If I could just go back one moment to the earlier question about understanding between Saudi Arabia and uh, the United States. I do think one of the consequences ultimately of 9-11 was a bigger effort in this country to understand the Arab world. And uh, I c certainly see it, I saw it when I was Director of National Intelligence and Deputy Secretary of State in terms of the amount of training and the number of people that we mobilized to study Arabic and so forth. I mean, most of us uh, who've traveled around the world know that in other countries there's a much greater knowledge of the United States than we ever have uh, in terms of a corresponding knowledge of the country that we're visiting. And sometimes we're stunned to find out the level of detail that people uh, uh, know about our country. But I think we're moving in the direction of trying to better understand the rest of the world. And I think certainly in the, that applies to the Arab world. Prince Turkey, I think this is going to be the last question because I'm getting a signal that we're almost out of time. Uh, tell me about your view on what seems to be the beginning of robotic warfare with the predator strikes in the federal administ tribal areas of Pakistan. We now have already testing a, a submarine without a crew, uh, fighter planes without a pilot. We seem to be moving in a whole new phase, but this, of course, has impacted very unfavorably on public opinion in Pakistan, and I was wondering how it's seen in the other parts of the world where you travel. The problem with the, with the predators, particularly in Pakistan, I think is twofold. Uh, one, the Pakistani government has been rather equivocal in, in its allowing predators to strike in Pakistani territory and flying out of Pakistani territory um, for one reason or another, mainly because popular sentiment in, in Pakistan uh, would not like them to, to allow those strikes to take place, especially because they come from America for all of the reasons that you have discussed earlier uh, and I'm sure we'll discuss uh, later. Uh, so. Every time there is a predator strike, in my view, it undermines the authority in Pakistan in having to stand up and defend itself against those critics within Pakistan who uh, would like to see these uh, strikes uh, ended. And by doing that, uh, as I said, the undermining of the authority of the Pakistani army particularly uh, creates dissension and, and uh, pressure points within the armed forces and in the government. The other drawback of these predator strikes, no matter how successful they are in eliminating individual Al-Qaeda members or so-called Taliban uh, leaders, uh, is the collateral damage that comes with them. Unintended consequences, the killing of innocents, whether children, women, old people, sometimes by mistake as well. Uh, eliminating 10, 15, sometimes 30 people at a wedding party or, or at a funeral or something like that. And that 
adds to the to the um, uh, anti-American sentiment uh, in Pakistan and in other uh, places where these strikes uh, take place. I hope you will join me in thanking these two me. formidable <laughs> characters here. <laughs> I'm sorry, out right. of time. <laughs> I would have liked to answer that. Well, of course. <laughs> Thank you.